Council and Payment, uh, National Payments uh, Corporation of India. The first is presented by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, Government of India, Reserve Bank of India, and supported by Niti Aayog, Startup India, and Investment Invest India. Session partner Australian Trade and Investment Commission, World Pay uh, from FIS, e Tech Corporation, CX Partners Index, Cloud Communication Partner, Root Mobile. Insight Partner, Credit Watch, Conversational Messaging Partner, Gupshop Credit, Insight Partner, TransUnion Center. We are here today to discuss a very crucial topic on exploring the evolution of AI investing and online wealth management. Without any further ado, let me first uh, introduce our moderator, Mr. Malik Khan Katupia. He is the founder and chairman from Finnovation Labs PTE Limited. And for the panelists, we have Ms. Aisha Abbas. She is the GM Affluent Head of Priority and Premium Banking and from Standard Chartered Bank. Mr. Charles Smith, Global Head of Digital Solutions, Wealth Management from Refinitiv. And Mr. Gaurav Rastogi, he is the founder and CEO from Provera.in. Requesting our audience to put down your questions in the chat window and we will try to address few of them by the end of the uh, session. With that, let me hand it over to Mr. Malik Khan Katodia. Over to you, Mr. Malik. Thank you, Shivani, and hi, everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on whichever part of the world you are in. Uh, it's my pleasure to be back here, to be back in India virtually, this time for GFF. And of course, I, I, I see that GFF keeps uh, doing bigger and better every year. So congratulations to all of you. Um, this is a, a fascinating uh, panel uh, that we, are, we have assembled here. And we are going to be talk, uh, discussing a topic which um, is certainly, uh, uh, there is a lot of buzz around that. Uh, especially after the pandemic, uh, we've seen a significant shift in change and evolution of consumer uh, behavior and also the way millennials operate. So uh, to discuss all of that with me, I have three fabulous panelists, uh, not just diverse in terms of um, uh, you know their backgrounds, but also different parts of the world. So we have Charles joining us early morning uh, from the East Coast. We have Aisha, uh, who is the luckiest of the lot, uh, sitting in a time zone, which is convenient whichever ways from Dubai. And then we have Gaurav and myself from uh, Singapore uh, time zone. So it's it's kind of late-ish uh, evening, just pre-dinner or post-dinner for us. Uh, so let me, without further ado, uh, request uh, the panelists to do a very quick introduction. Aisha, will start with you, followed by uh, Charles and Gaurav. Thank you so much, Malik, for uh, uh, the kind invite and introduction. I'm delighted to be here. In, in this very exciting uh, discussion today with um, a, a great um, a team of panelists. And I welcome all the attendees uh, from wherever you are um, on the world joining this interactive session. We will encourage questions also, please. So, so please do that. My name is Aisha Abbas. I am uh, GM Affluent. Uh, for Standard Chartered Bank based here in the UAE mm -hmm. and um, covering uh, markets in Africa, uh, wider GCC and uh, Pakistan, uh, predominantly within the affluent segment. So very close to the subject that we're going to be talking about today, which is part conventional, part AI, part digital. So all of that mix is very, very exciting. And I'm truly delighted to be here with all of you today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Charles and Gaurav, and, and this is uh, no particular bias, although we always prefer to give the first shot to the lady, but I'm just going in alphabetical order. <laughs> no problem. Uh, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. This is Charles Smith. I head up the digital solutions business at Refinitiv in, in the wealth management space. And Refinitiv, as you may know, was recently acquired by the London Stock Exchange Group. But uh, at Refinitiv, we focus on delivering uh, comprehensive data analytics and solutions for financial services globally. Uh, in wealth management, I focus on the digital solutions area, which is uh, creating client experience uh, capabilities. So client portals, digital advice capabilities, digital co collaboration tools, mobile solutions that wealth managers can, can use as part of their offering to their, to their investors. And that's a global uh, offering that we have. You know, we focus uh, quite a bit of our time now in Asia and, and Europe, although we've been in the United States for quite a while. Um, so I'm happy to be here. This is a great opportunity, I guess, to, for all of us to speak and really get a better feel for what's going on in the market. It's been a, a really interesting past 18 to 24 months, uh, both uh, in wealth management and, of course, in the digital space. I'm happy to be here and happy to uh, talk to this great group. Gaurav, over to you. 
Uh, thanks, Malik. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to thank um, the Global Fintech Press for inviting me. Um, really good to be here and you know, to be part of this panel and uh, to share some thoughts on what's happening in the investing world um, in AI and machine learning um, these days. Uh, I am the founder and CEO of Covera.in. We were one of the first robot advisors in India and then we have now moved into a full fledged wealth tech platform. Um, we cover mutual funds, digital gold, um, international investing, um, and many more products in our pipeline. So uh, we have about a million plus users now. Uh, I've seen some of the, you know, some of the kind of changes in new age investors that have happened in the past two years uh, from the front seat. So super, super excited about to share some of that, some of my thoughts on that, and also to learn more from uh, from the fellow panelists. Thanks again. Thank you, Gaurav. And I think that's a great segue to start our discussion. You spoke about new age investors. Uh, so you cannot have any discussion without talking about the rise of uh, disruptors. And Charles, I'm sure, will uh, you know kind of echo my sentiments being based uh, in the US. So uh, we have seen a significant uh, rise, and, and if I may say, even an explosion, especially since the pandemic over the last 18 odd months. Uh, of platforms like Robinhood, which have really, uh, you know, kind of disrupted this market with uh, their zero brokerage offering. And it's uh, Robinhood has been around for about five, six years, but especially in the last 18 months, we've seen a significant rise and, and ramp up. At the same time, there have been uh, reports that Revolut is also launching in the USA and will probably go this route. Um, it's quite fascinating that, you know, it, this has really spurred incumbents as well. And I was very pleasantly surprised uh, last week when I logged into my uh, online uh, banking platform. I won't name the bank. It's not my policy to name and shame. And anyway, I, I was on the other side with a global bank as well. But my 150 year old global bank uh, to which I do my investments in trading out of Singapore, uh, they actually had a banner saying, hey, zero brokerage offering uh, trial for uh, our customers. So obviously the incumbents are feeling, uh, if I may say, the heat. And uh, they have been spurred into action. Uh, my question on this is to Aisha and Charles. What is your take on this? Is this something which is really the way and the wave of the future? Or is this a passing fad and once, um, you know, the pandemic subsides and once people go back uh, to their uh, normal life, if, I, if there's even going to be anything normal and, and they go back to their offices and stop uh, sitting on their screens and trading, is this uh, something which passing fad uh, and uh, disruptors will need to uh, maybe align with the traditional models uh, for sustainable monetization or is this trend not only here to stay but it will only accelerate um, Aisha and Charles thanks Charles if I could go first and um, then of course you being the real expert in the field can um, can please elaborate on on what I'm uh, saying it's a great question um, See, disruptor and being disruptive is is has been the new in thing for for a long time. Uh, so, do disruptors have a place? Absolutely, yes. And uh, you specifically spoke about um, Robinhood and brokerage. Uh, brokerage has a place. It has a place in a portfolio. May it be a tactical portfolio or a strategic portfolio uh, for a client. And whether this um, consumer is um, uh, you know someone on the private banking side or or just a millennial who who is uh, starting through um, he, he or she would be interested in uh, you know trying out um, uh, buying and selling of uh, stocks and shares uh, online i don't think it's a passing fad uh, brokerage and tr online trading and new ways of um, investing are here to stay uh, definitely, and not just for the millennials or, or the newcomers um, on this side, but also for the traditionalists. Um, the point you made about, um, you know, whether they're going to stay, um, it's about monetization as well. So you you talked about your 150-year-old bank, right? So what do they do? They are certainly going to place themselves as an outfit that can offer 
um, brokerage at zero fee. But at the same time, the monetization will come through other cross-sell activities. For example, the traditional banks are going to also fulfill your needs, such as getting your credit card, getting your mortgage, um, ensuring your payments are aligned. So when you send your children off to education to other parts of the world, um, you know, ensuring the monies reach them on time. So that is uh, some of the way that they're going to get their monetization um, uh, through. But those outfits that are simply digital or digital only, we have various examples in Asia, um, where in South Korea, I'm not going to name also uh, going by what you also said, or in China, you would know the outfits that I'm talking about. And they're really leveraging it, not through rates or monetization, but through the experience. The simplified journey that the consumer is able to find while they're trading online, that is the real game changer. Um, and, and whether you are a conventional 150 year old outfit or you are a new disruptor, it's all about experience because the consumer today, whether a newcomer or a traditionalist is looking for that simplicity um, and, and, and that value. Um, so I would certainly say that um, uh, you know, brokerage has a place and the new disruptors are also looking at um, different ways of working. So, so they would borrow and rent rather than owning and building. And that's how you know the cost space will also reduce. While the conventional outfits obviously carry that whole um, you know balance sheet uh, with them as well. Uh, so certainly not a fad, uh, Malik. It's here to stay. Uh, over to you, Charles. Thank you. Sure, and I think Aisha, I think you're you're spot on with your assessment. I think uh, it's simplicity is what's driving Robinhood. I think the zero brokerage option opened the door right um, for them, but it's really the the attraction of the usability the ease of use, the education, the, the way they make it uh, a gamification type of an experience, which you know some may say that's almost too easy to trade, but it did bring in a lot of business. It did make people aware of their investments. It made them more able to go and do things that they normally were afraid of for doing with a 150-year-old bank, right? which is sometimes hard to use and many steps to, to trade, a lot of information being thrown at you. I think the importance there is it puts the, the tools in the hands of the investor. It gives them information to make the investments happen, right? And the understanding of what they're trying to do. Um, and it makes it, you know, a, a available to all. And I think the other banks who have tried to copy that, right, can do it. You mentioned your bank, right, offering zero brokerage commissions, but it isn't really a zero brokerage commission that drives a lot of folks to Robinhood and Revolut. It's the experience, right? So again, I agree. It's, it's a part. It's going to be a part of investing going forward. I'm not sure the way Robinhood makes money is the way all banks will make money in brokerage. I think they do it through order flow. That may not be the best way to do it long term. I'm sure the regulators will have something to say about that. But other banks who have done it, have done it well, like I know in the United States, Charles Schwab has done it very well. They make money from interest income. There are other ways to make money in brokerage. And I think they're, it's going to be here to stay. But to Asia's point, the way the long-term players are going to succeed is in the overall offer, right? Providing advice, providing other solutions, right? These younger investments today are going in with some money and making some investments. But you know, over 5, 10, 15 years, they're going to need more solutions from banks and brokerages. It's going to be around mortgages, loans, advice, managing for uh, bequeathment of your assets. It's all that has to happen. That's not gonna be done through Robinhood, right? So it's about providing the full digital experience, right? Offering tools that allow them to manage their entire life cycle. Thank you. And I'm, I'm glad that both of you brought up this order flow model and, and Aisha also referenced to alternative, um, you know, monetization models and also how the incumbents probably rely more on cross sell, upsell, et cetera. Whereas the disruptors really try and even, uh, you know, kind of uh, turn it over on its head uh, when it comes to these kinds of models. And there are obviously regulatory risks. So I'm glad, Charles, you brought that up. And we know uh, some of the scrutiny that Robin Hood is under for this order flow kind of a thing, etc. Early days, so we'll not pass any value judgments. But uh, it it is something uh, which really is different from what we've seen or, or for uh, a long time uh, former banker like me. So it, it is fascinating. I also have one more thing, and that kind of forms the segue to the next question that I want to uh, ask Gaurav. And, and uh, Aisha and Charles, you are free to kind of uh, jump into that as well. Uh, for some reason, the market seem to love these disruptors a lot. And, and you know, we know that uh, the markets don't really like traditional banks in terms of market cap, etc. But I was just, um, you know, I was surprised to see that uh, Robinhood's market cap uh, is... Uh, probably two thirds of HSBC or, uh, you know, slightly less than half of city where I spent a large part of my career. So it, it just boggled the mind on how much the market seems to love these 
um, uh, disruptors and another one uh, coinbase which is purely operating in crypto has a market cap of uh, 50 billion whereas uh, city struggling to you know kind of cross 150 billion again so let me go to uh, gaurav on that and, and gaurav you run a platform congratulations you said you have a, a million odd customers we have seen this uh, trend which uh, both as a practitioner but also as an academic because i also teach fintech uh, to mba students it's it's fascinating um, you know uh, for the academic in me as well on how uh, gamification in investments and trading has moved from being a, a fad that you could just discount or say hey it's so you know stupid and it'll it'll die a natural death it's it's really taken a life of its own and many of us um, who've tracked it or who have uh, teenage kids or nephews like my 20 year old nephew uh, you know they really uh, seem to believe the truth of what is discussed in reddit in the wall street bets kind of communities and and how what kind of a cultish if i may say um, uh, you know kind of icons mama kathy or kathy word or papa musk have become one tweet from papa musk can you know kind of change the uh, market cap and of of companies and cryptos uh, if you kind of put all of that and that is just one aspect right we spoke about robin hood and zero brokerage but if you kind of look at how tweeting communities 10 million um, millennials aggregating together, fractional investing and social investing, thanks to the likes of eToro, etc., or even tokens, cryptos, and now the latest buzz NFTs, which are being offered on these platforms, on on Robinhood, on Revolut, on Coinbase, etc. It's it's just something which uh, I think deserves a lot more um, kind of. Uh, interest and and perhaps research from our end on how the customers of the and, and these guys are going to be uh, the customers of the future very soon they're already there maybe their ticket sizes are small now but in five to ten years they are going to be the mainstream customers so is the customer of the future operating in a very different universe if i may say so there you know it's not just about trading and zero brokerage anymore their entire idea about money itself seems to be very, very different. They believe in, in decentralization. They believe in this whole idea of people's money. And we've seen how they've gone after uh, various shorts and, and they kind of do short squeezes, etc. So there is almost an element of, um, you know, social investing combined with some sort of a political backlash. So the, uh, you know, kind of give it back to the big bad uh, fat cats, all of these, the social aspect, the uh, the technological aspects seem to be coming together. And if this really is the way that uh, customers are going to operate over the next five to 10 years, and this is here to stay, then what does it mean for uh, not just the incumbents, but for the financial markets themselves? Um, it's a very, very interesting question, honestly, right? And, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say I have all the answers. I'll just try and say a couple of things here, right? So, I look at it at two different things. Okay, so um, if you think about people's relationship with money, how they access money, how they use money, what do they think money means? It's a number in your digital wallet versus it's physical notes in your wallet. Um, a lot of these have behavioral impact on how easy or difficult it is for you to spend it. Right, Some, something like ownership of that money is less if you're not physically handing it over. Right, so I do believe that a lot of that is changing. A lot of that fiction uh, is going away, and a lot of that when that fiction goes away, we will see behavior that would have been very hard to predict. That would be very hard to just kind of sit and theorize that this is how people would behave if you took away the entire fiction of having notes and having paying paying someone something and then getting change back, right? So, so that, that, that's the difficult part of the question. See, what I also believe is the idea of the market has not changed much, right? I think one of the basic tenets for me of a market, and uh, I did my uh, MBA from Chicago Booth, so, so you'll, you'll forgive me if this comes across as, one of the basic tenets is that, you know, different operators will try and impose their ideas on the market for a profit, right? So, one way to think about it is, is Twitter and Reddit and, you know, um, GameStop and whatever that whatever is happening, is it redefining what it means to be a market? The other way to think about it is, 
bucket shops bucket shops have been there for centuries you know penny stock trading has been there for centuries right it's just that the way that people get together to create a short squeeze or to create an arbitrage or create a pump and dump has now become more visible in some sense today we can see that or again we can theorize that a pump and dump happened on a penny stock 20 years ago it was still happening it's not like you know it's not the markets are never clean clean like the way we would want them to be they always have their shady corners uh, it's just that today some of that uh, some of that part is a lot in the limelight so um, i would i would think that while yes yeah, some of the relationship is changing and some of those behaviors um will will be will be difficult for us to theorize on but markets in general i don't think are impacted much i'll just go back to one of the things that charles also mentioned what actually excites me a lot in a, in in all of this and which is why i keep gamification out of this so i don't think that uh, people discussing stocks on reddit or you know uh, uh, tweets and all that is gamification right um gamification for me or, or at least you know as as someone who also runs a platform is what we have now right what a lot of platforms today have is vast access to interaction data so there is an ability to mine it using machine learning models um and what we are seeing now is the first vintage of uh platforms being able to create highly targeted nudges to get to a specified outcome right so for example did you buy this stock because of your research or did you buy this stock because you were shown just the right amount of data based on some look alike models or some machine learning or i mean we don't even know what these models are thinking right because a lot of these models are not kind of structured models right but where you shown just the right set of data to get you to the point where you pull the trigger right so that is supremely interesting uh, because that in a positive scenario makes trading and wealth management truly personal is literally tailored for you as an individual for your goals for your style of trading right um, the risk here is also very obvious right as a platform or as a, that is creating these nudges are they creating these nudges for the benefit of the platform or for the benefit of the investor and what is also happening is it's becoming very difficult to differentiate between the two so while a lot of this data and a lot of this technology is giving us an immense power in how we can almost kind of you know create user journeys with a very high level of probability is it eventually going to help the end user or not is still an open question thank you gaurav and, and i think you uh, touched upon a very important point about the use or uh, perhaps i don't know if it is borderline misuse of Uh, uh such a treasure trove of data and and uh, even if we don't want to use the term gamification in this context perhaps if i may say uh social buying or social trading or even uh, influencer based uh, trading or kol and and platforms like etoro or even robinhood actually showcase it right these are the top traders this is what they it is you can almost do like copycat uh, trades things which Uh, at times forget that they they weren't there in the traditional platforms they still aren't there but they may be uh, skirting the edges of uh, the gray areas of regulation etc as well and and how um, safe is it that's why i said you know there is a, almost a redefinition of the relationship of uh, these millennials with money itself even if it is not pure uh, gamification in the classic sense of how we see gamification but the fact that they operate uh, again loosely you uh, using this term they operate in a kind of a herd and and you're right got of that uh, you know uh, penny trading has been around and we've all seen that movie wolf of wall street but this time it's kind of different there is uh, a socio cultural and if i may dare say even a political aspect to it i won't go there charles you probably are <laughs> best place to answer that but we saw when this whole uh, game stop mania was going around and short squeezes that uh, Uh, uh you know the sec came into the picture and then some uh, left leaning politicians in the us uh, including aoc had those tweets that hey if the hedge fund guy does it it's okay it's part of the market but if the if 10 million little guys do it why are they kind of called into question and why is this like market manipulation so anyway there are many of these um, you know unanswered questions and and absolutely new things which we'll hopefully try and cover when we get to uh, regulations but um 
for me, what is fascinating is the behavior of these users and how they kind of associate with money. And if you bring in crypto and NFTs into the picture, it's, it's really, really uh, fascinating. I mean, and for them, the fact that money does not even need to come from a central bank and, and it can be pure P2P is, is a reality. We may still be grappling with it, despite me being so deep in that space. Uh, I sometimes struggle to wrap my head around it. But for them, this is the, you know, we call them digital natives for a reason. So let me continue on this theme and I'll go back to uh, Charles uh, and, and Gaurav and Aisha, uh, you are free to come in as well. Uh, this seems to be tying in with the broader theme of the two Ds, right? Democratization and decentralization, not just of uh, traditional investment instruments, but in, even things like uh, which were erstwhile considered sophisticated or institutional investments, whether it is bonds or real estate, etc. And we've seen uh, platforms. I don't know how many of you are aware, but one of our uh, cohort mates has set up this platform called Bond E-Value in Singapore. I'm sure Gaurav, you might be aware of it, which is the first blockchain powered bond platform, which allows you to do uh, fractional bond trading. So you don't have to have a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars to invest in bonds. You can uh, literally buy fractions of bonds uh, in the form of tokens through tokenization. Similarly, there's a platform launched by a friend of mine in India called RealX. Uh, which allows you to do the same with real estate. And there are quite a few other platforms in Singapore and uh, Hong Kong, again, launched by some of my cohort mates, which allow you to get a very tiny fraction, almost like one square feet of uh, real estate in expensive uh, Hong Kong or Singapore. So my question, Charles, to you, and, and again, Gaurav and uh, Aisha, please uh, come in if you want to add to that. Is this really a golden era of investments and true decentralization that we are witnessing where the little guy is more empowered than ever before? Or is it some sort of old wine in new bottle, you know, considering that REITs have been around for a long time and products like these uh, have been around? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, um, look, I think we're on the verge, I think, uh, of a big shift in investing, right? I think we're seeing it now with more and more people getting involved with equity investing. But I think the ability to tokenize assets uh, allows so many things, more things to happen in the market, right? The ability to take any asset and split it up and provide, you know, the ability to buy into it from any level, right? You know, whether it be a large retail or small retail investor, I think it's a, a huge boon to um, anyone out there who's looking to invest or borrow or lend. I think it's um, a trend that we're going to see more and more of. I think, you know, the issue here is going to be technology. Can technology scale and support the ability to tokenize all these assets? Is there right technology in place that can handle it and can scale? Right to do it, um, and it can be done properly, right, with the ability to track uh, all these different assets and do it, you know, in a way that it makes sure that everyone's uh, invested properly and is tracked properly is important. I think, um, I think that we're we're just really just seeing the beginning of this. I think this will be a, a new trend for everyone. I've been talking about this for a while, for many years, about the ability to use blockchain and technology like that to create a decentralized environment. I think we're going to see more and more firms do this. I think it's a great opportunity for. Uh, assets that normally could not have been traded, you know, uh, large real estate investments, art, um, you know, any type of collectible, right, can now be, you know, portioned out and sold. I think we're going to see a lot more of this going forward. I'd love to hear what Garvin and Aish have to say, but I think this is something we're going to see more and more of from the big firms going forward. Fascinating. And before I, I uh, open it for Aisha and Gaurav, I just, you mentioned about art and collectibles, and, and I was just uh, on a panel last week where we had, which was specifically on NFTs. And it's fascinating. Not only are we talking about tokenization of art or, uh, you know, these high value collectibles, but now there is uh, fractionalization and, and, you know, kind of fractional NFTs as well. So it, this space just seems to be coming up with newer and newer things uh, every month, if not every week. So it, it's fascinating. You know, we move from uh, fractional real estate now to art and uh, through non-fungible tokens. And now even that is getting fractionalized. So I don't know how this is really going to evolve. But Aisha and Gaurav, anything you would like to add? Just one thing I would add, you know, and I, I believe it most of what Charles, I, I do generally believe tokenization can be a game changer. I think uh, the technology is there, the adoption is there. I don't, I don't see any risk from those angles. I think, I think uh, to me, it's mostly a regulatory concern. How does regulation globally uh, look at, uh, especially tokenized real estate, real estate, uh, again, like we don't want to go there, but real estate in most uh, demographic, most geographies becomes very highly politicized, politicized, right? So, how does re does regulation allow this tokenization or not? Is my only concern. But otherwise, I, I do genuinely believe that 
um, just like fractional share trading kind of was a watershed moment in how trading happens in the US, that can be true for pretty much any asset, liquid or illiquid, like Charles is saying, uh, through this uh, tokenized framework. And I mean, I, I, I can only hope that most, uh, you know, most uh, banking regulators allow that as a product, but that's, that remains to be seen. Yeah, and I think, Malik, the only thing I'll add to this is um, uh, what, what Gaurav has just mentioned, right? Um, the regulation and the standardization, uh, because all of these disruptors, as they come through and they really excite the market and they really excite the uh, the consumer, and the consumer may not always be fully educated on this, right? And as Charles had mentioned before, that, you know, how, how did you get to hear about it? And Gaurav, Gaurav said that too. Um, that, you know, when you have that nudge, did you actually do a lot of research or, or did it just come through because, you know, someone in the background um, is just feeding you with information on what others like you may be doing? Um, so I think the, the, the regulatory standardization and consumer awareness and education, is, it plays a very important part in all of this. Thank you. And, and now that both of you have spoken about regulations, uh, one cannot complete a discussion on this topic without at least briefly uh, touching upon regulations and why we don't have a regulator on this uh, panel. I will uh, definitely still ask Charles and Aisha for your perspectives. Uh, and I think it's also fascinating. I, I gave that example of uh, some tweets by politicians uh, when the SEC got involved. And we've seen we've seen two trends, in fact, over the last 18 months in this particular bull rally. So we've seen the occasional familiar shocks to the financial uh, system, whether we saw the collapse of uh, Archigo's capital, uh, you know, $20 billion lost uh, in, in 48 hours, perhaps the biggest such collapse, at least I have seen uh, to the recent concerns around uh, the credit bubble in China, especially around real estate and with whole with this ever grand uh, kind of uh, significant concern and the default. So these, while they are concerning, these are challenges which, um, you know, the market participants as well as the regulators have been fairly familiar with and aware of for a long time. These have happened in the past, including in the 2008-2009 GFC, uh, when I was very much in the thick of things uh, and I was a banker myself. At the same time, we've seen entirely new classes of challenges. Um, and I gave the example of the congressional hearing for GameStop. And for those of us who actually saw that on CNBC or Bloomberg, when uh, you know the so-called group leader of this Wall Street bets with the nickname uh, Roaring Kitty, uh, he was invited for the hearing, and the way he kind of uh, actually spoke so matter-of-factly and said, "Hey, this is not penny stock trading, or this is not uh, herd operating. I have done my own research. I have put it out there, like you would do on social media, and people agree with my." Uh, research and and uh, you know that's how we are operating it so that is one aspect of it the other uh, we heard briefly about uh, regulations around uh, tokenization and, and fractional assets going beyond traditional asset classes and and if I may make it a little more broad uh, the entire spectrum of crypto regulations which is a whole discussion in itself um, you know in another blockchain or crypto event but uh, we've seen just two days back or three days back China announcing yet another uh, crackdown on crypto. Um, uh, and, and this is not the first time it's happening. There are so many unanswered uh, questions, including, uh, you know, the very fundamental and basic premise of how do you even regulate something which by its very nature is cross border and uh, beyond uh, territorial jurisdictional boundaries. Uh, so my question to uh, Charles and Aisha is, uh, and again, I know we are not speaking for regulators, but in your perspective, do you get a sense in your interactions with regulators or otherwise that they are really now uh, entering and operating in uncharted territories? And the question is, how do they even regulate these areas, which probably are evolving faster than most of us can follow, uh, you know, least of all regulators who come from fairly uh, oftentimes traditional uh, supervision background. So are we really seeing uh, a, a new phase or a new era where regulators will either work very, very closely with the industry to make sense of what is happening, or we'll probably see knee-jerk reactions? Yeah, I'll start and I'll be brief. I know we're, we're close on time, but I think, you know, all the regulators, I know globally are very stretched in terms of resourcing and 
capability, right? I think to your point, uh, Malik, we're seeing so much new technology, new capabilities coming out. I think it's very difficult for them to manage all of it. I think, unfortunately, I think, you know, in some cases they tend to overregulate in those areas, but they don't really understand like what is happening. I think it is all very new to, to all of us, really. Um, I think it'll come down to, you know, how well can we educate the, the regulators, make them understand what, what the goal is what we're trying to accomplish and provide information that allows them to regulate properly. I think, you know, there is very much gun shy from, you know, past history where, you know, things have gone haywire, right? Things have gone wrong and you know, they're trying to really do their best to protect the investor, but uh, hopefully they don't over-regulate. I think Garb mentioned it, right? If, you know, with tokenization, hopefully they'll allow us to do that. I think it's a great way to democratize investing and allow many people to get involved and do it safely. Um, hopefully they'll understand the benefits of it and not see the drawbacks and allow it to happen. So I think it's about making sure they're well-educated and helping them understand what we're trying to accomplish and how it's going to benefit the overall investor more so than, than hurt them. And and I can only add to what uh, Charles has just mentioned, which is very, very prompt, that the industry has been evolving. It is an evolution. And as the industry evolved, the regulator also learned and the regulator became aware and, and put forward those regulations for us um, against which we are governed. I think we must always uh, re remember and learn from our mistakes of the past because, um, you know, big banking giants have had to um, face he heavy regulatory fines as well uh, for sometimes not meeting the regulatory requirements. So the, the regulators are also becoming more and more aware and, and they are not trying to play catch up because they don't have to, but it is the industry players who need to ensure um, that they can give the comfort to the consumer that they are regulated and you know in in countries such as uae consumer pr protection regulation is is coming out very strongly and all the players obviously will have to um, uh, ensure that they abide by those um, regs which are also evolving and i completely agree with charles um, that education of the regulator and uh, the end consumer awareness both play a part in this i i think the the industry disruptors or um, the conventional players can't just be mavericks. Yeah, they've got to um, protect the end consumer at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, uh, you know, along with disruption, there needs to be ongoing financial literacy and education. That's a great point. Uh, we just have four minutes left, and I will try and summarize and distill a couple of questions here, which are here in the Q&A section, which essentially deal with uh, the ethical aspects of AI investing. And, and this is something which I also wanted to ask you about algo trading and how, um, you know, with the rise of AI, we know that algos have been kind of, uh, they've automated the actual trading process in the markets for well over a decade. But now we are seeing AI versus AI and each, uh, you know, kind of fund house or each investment bank has, is, is trying to get into this AI arms race, if one were to say so. So uh, the question here is, is, is the future going to be a scenario where market participants are entirely going to be replaced with algos and if so and, and and you know learning machines which will learn more and more from the data as Gaurav said and there is a gray line where do we draw the line on um, not just regulations but also self-governed ethical behavior and this question is open for any of the three uh, that you might want to take we just have maybe three minutes so if you can keep it I'll just spend 30 seconds on it before before we move forward very, very quickly. You see, what, what is everyone trying to do? Everyone is trying to simplify for the end user, uh, commercialize their platforms, and, um, and ensure that their products and services reach the end users and they get into profitability, right? That, that's what everyone's trying to do, whether you're a conventional bank or, or you're a new player in the market. Um, when it comes to algos, are they going to completely replace uh, a human? No because your end user and your consumer still would like to have that human touch. So it's digital with a human touch. There was a time when, uh, you know, people used to read the newspapers to see how many cars is Ford selling in order to see which way the market is going. That has now changed. The information is available 24-7. Uh, um, you don't have to call a CFA certified investment advisor sitting in a big building wearing a pinstripe suit. You don't have to do that. The information is available. But that can also then lead to speculative trading, which can harm the consumer. Um, so, so I think it's a fine balance um, that everyone's trying to find here. I'll, I'll pause and pass it on to. Thank you. Charles Goro. Just, just quickly, I think the AI systems that we build are only as smart as people that build them, right? They're taught by rules, right? They're taught by, um, you know, process of, of, of 
giving them the the tools to become intelligent, right? So we teach them and, and inform them and build them properly, then we should be able to manage them just like any other human, right? And to Aisha's point, it will be a combined technology, human-centric type of solution. It's not going to be pure AI. It's going to be some, some type of human element as part of that solution as well. Got a final word. My belief is, right, the amount of data that is being pushed out these days, it's almost impossible for humans to keep up. Right? See, I think the future that you're talking about is already here. Between high-frequency traders, between algos, that is the majority of the market. If you are a little guy, you should be a buy-and-hold indexer. And actually, if you look at the evidence of the last 10 years, that's what's happening. The good thing about investing is that um, the feedback loop is really fast. If you're a bad trader, you'll probably know that in three to six months, unless you know you don't follow your own data. So um, it, it's very unlikely for someone to be a bad trader for 10 years. That, that, that doesn't happen in the market. Right? So um, I have a lot of friends who are still quants. I used to be a quant before, uh, before I started the, the, the investment platform. And what they tell me is that half-life of strategies has been decreasing over time. You come up with a new signal, you come up with this new strategy, and it's most likely going to make money only for the next six to nine months, right? Alpha strategies are getting squeezed, and you see that in the returns of hedge funds, you see that in returns of uh, high-frequency trading firms, that the return on capital is not what it used to be. And you also see that in terms of how capital allocators are now allocating capital. A lot more capital is now being allocated to private markets. Because the belief is that at least there is an information arbitrage there, at least there is a network arbitrage there, which is harder to close, while in public markets it's becoming more and more difficult for anyone to come in and prove a sustained edge. So, I mean, my take is that we are already at that future. Thank you. We've heard three different fascinating perspectives. Uh, let me try and summarize and conclude on a more optimistic note to what you said, Gaurav, that uh, at least in the pr public markets, uh, information arbitrage has reduced. Perhaps that means that the, there is less of an advantage for the hedge funds. And as we've discussed, the 2Ds, decentralization and democratization, perhaps there is uh, a more even le level playing field for the little guy and, and these Wall Street bets and, and Redditors. So with that optimistic note, uh, we have come to the end of this session. Uh, I would have loved to continue and ask a couple of more questions, but the clock is ticking. So... I want to uh, express my sincere and heartfelt thanks to Charles, Aisha, and Gaurav for some great perspectives. I really enjoyed this panel. Thank you. Over to you, Shivani. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, uh, Ms. Aisha, uh, Mr. Rasogi. Thank you for joining us today and sharing your uh, valuable time with us. Uh, we also, I would also like to thank our audience for joining us today. We are signing off. Thank you so much. Thank you. Happy investing.